Good morning, everyone, or I should say good afternoon. It's two o'clock. Thank you so much for being here for our digital resources panel today. Um, I'm so pleased to be able to welcome um, everyone that we have on our panel um, to the discussion today, including Mashawn Hardy with Iodeli Drum and Dance, Alex Inglesian with Experimental Sound Studio, Yao with Lynx Hall, and Tamara Becerra Valdez with Public Media Institute. Um, I'd like to take a moment um, just for a few housekeeping things. This is being live captioned today. Um, if you need captions, please feel free to um, click on the CC button in your toolbar and that will allow you to follow along. Um, we will be having a about a 60 minute presentation today um, in which I will be asking a series of questions to our wonderful presenters. And, um, and then we will all have the option to ask questions. You will all have the option to ask questions directly. Um, if during the presentation you want to put your questions in the Q&A box, um, feel free to do so and we will be sure to get to those at the end. Um, so let's see, today um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who we have with us. Okay, um, first I am pleased to share um, information about Yao, who is the production manager and associate curator at Lynx Hall. Yao was born in Vietnam and lived in a refugee camp with his family for two years in Indonesia before arriving in the United States in 1982. Yao oversees Lynx Hall's production and technical needs for artists and performances maintains Studio A performance space and does curatorial work focusing on developing use of tech in performance. Michonne Hardy, who is a lifelong Chicagoan, um, has more than 20 years of experience in dance, information technology, marketing, and arts administration. Uh, she has danced with Seneca West African Percussion Ensemble, Muntu Dance Theater of Chicago, and Iodeli Drum and Dance, which she is here today on behalf of. Michonne produces concerts, conferences, and performances, and develops social media strategies for artists and arts organizations. Currently, she is a founding member and the business manager at Iodeli Drum and Dance, social media manager at the Jazz Institute of Chicago, and Assistant Director of Community Arts Partnership and Strategy at the Riva and David Logan Center for the Arts. In addition to her work in the arts, Michonne has led technology projects as a senior systems analyst at Electronic Data Systems and Hewlett Packard. Michonne received a BS in advertising from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a CCP certificate from the Institute for, for Professional Development in the College of Computing and Digital Media at DePaul University. Alex Inglesian um, is a Chicago-based artist, composer, musician, engineer, and educator. His work explores the boundaries of noise, harmony, silence, space, performance, and improvisation. He is a graduate of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and is currently the technical director and lead recording engineer at Experimental Sound Studio, an internationally recognized nonprofit sound art organization. Alex is also a professor of sound for film studies and music production at Northwestern University and the School of the Art Institute. He frequently performs among the vibrant Chicago experimental music scene and regularly collaborates with filmmakers. Inglesian is deeply influenced by the rich history of experimental electronic music and improvisation and continues to draw inspiration from the contemporary artists he works with professionally and creatively on a daily basis. Um, also with us today is Tamara Becerra Valdez. She is a visual artist and holds an MFA from the University of Illinois at Chicago. 
As a producer at Public Media Institute, she oversees production operations and media partnerships at Lumpen TV. She is a 2021 recipient of the Make a Wave grant awarded by Three Arts in Chicago. Also, Nick Wiley was to join us today, also from Public Media Institute in Chicago. Um, but unfortunately, he has just um, had the booster shot and is experiencing some symptoms from that and will not be present with us today, um, but assures us that Tamara has all the information. <laughs> so um, I'd like to take a moment to ask each of our um, uh, panelists to introduce themselves and um, how you interact with media at your organization, a little brief description. Also, I will offer um, uh, that my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, for anyone who needs a visual description, um, I am a white woman in my late 40s in my bedroom in Evanston, also known as the unseated uh, lands of the Kickapoo. I'm sitting in front of a blue wall with a beautiful blue painting, wearing a blue shirt um, with light blue eyeglasses. I have brown hair that's recently been added um, that I've added some red to recently. Um, and I'm here on behalf of the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation as the program associate. And I am thrilled that we have um, this special group of arts leaders from organizations that we fund present with us today. So I will um, pass it over um, to Michonne to get started and then you can send it around the room. Sure, thank you, Clover. Uh, hi, my name is Michonne Hardy. I am a middle-aged African-American woman who is sitting on her couch in her living room in front of a yellow wall with culturally specific artwork to Africa. Uh, I am wearing an African print, I don't know, this is yellow, red, blue, white, all the colors, uh, jacket. Uh, on, I have short hair, which is naturally curly, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Oh, I am the business manager of Iodele Drum and Dance, as Clover has said, and the way that my dance company is uh, an African dance, female-centered African dance organization that uses dance to heal and promote wellness among women and children. Uh, we are all female drummers uh, and dancers. The way that we interact with media and use media at our dance company is to interact with our community, uh, during COVID, we were forced to uh, come up with new ways to have dance classes that we promote, uh, we have on a weekly basis. We have two weekly dance classes a week, and we had started to do those over Zoom, and those have now become hybrid in person and over Zoom. So we have dance classes on Zoom. We use media for social media purposes to create short videos. Uh, that it explain what we do and also engage with our community that way. We also learn to use guerrilla style media to create performances and uh, virtual uh, workshops that we then shop to clients and uh, have uh, sent to clients. So those are the ways that we deal with media with the company. Um, I think I've said enough and yeah, your turn. We cannot hear you. Okay, you should be able to hear me now. Okay. Yes. I had, I had too much technology plugged into this, uh, and so I had to unplug something real quick. But uh, my name is Yao Trong. Uh, I, I go by he, him, and I am the production manager, associate curator for Lynx Hall. I am in, in Lynx Hall currently. Uh, behind me are some uh, block windows that are backlighting me. Uh, there are some uh, trifolded panels, wood, wooden panels uh, that closes, but they're open currently. There's a tripod currently over here to my right uh, by brick walls. I am wearing a white hoodie. Um, and my hair is a little longer than I like to keep it. Uh, but yeah, other than that, uh, that is uh, me. And I am. Uh, uh, I guess I'm a little bit about Lynx Hall. Lynx Hall 
is a, is a space that encourages artistic innovation and public engagement by maintaining an, a facility and providing flexible programming for research, development, and presentation of new work in the performing arts. Uh, and I've been, I've been working with Lynx for over, I want to say 10 years now, but I, was full, I, I became full-time staff like about maybe a year ago. Uh, and uh, what, how we engage with uh, the media here is, um, well, I, for myself, I consider, I, I, use, I use technology as a, um, a sort of a, a tool or medium like paint in a way. Uh, I like, so I like to explore how, how, how you can tell stories and how you can create performances using those tools. Uh, and so, so a lot of time I work with artists and sort of, you know, figuring things out and saying what's possible to explore, to innovate and to create with. Uh, and then we also have a team of uh, audio engineers, uh, lighting designer, camera uh, uh, switchers, camera, uh, camera person as well too, uh, to be able to work with the artists uh, in, in, that, in, in the ability to be able to create their, their vision virtually slash hybrid as well now. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, I think that's all I have for now. So I guess I will uh, popcorn to Alex. Great, thanks, Yao, and um, honored to be here. Um, thanks for the invite, Clover. Um, my name is Alex Inglesian um, from Experimental Sound Studio. Uh, I go by he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm a white male in my late 30s with a beard and a black knit hat and a black collared shirt. Um, I guess this is the standard sound engineer outfit. Um, and uh, I'm currently at the uh, Experimental Sound Studio in our main recording space. You can see behind me are these uh, burlap uh, sound absorption panels that we've actually built um, and customized here for the studio. Um, and it's all modular and we can, uh, it's pretty quick and change the acoustics of the space. But, um, and I've got a window behind me, which is our window to our uh, isolation booth to record vocals and a speaker. Um, but uh, yeah, my uh, I've I've been with Experimental Sound Studio since about 2007. Um, was originally connected with the organization and the sound art community in Chicago through studying at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and uh, my role here is one of the three co-directors. We we work kind of in a collaborative directorship model, um, and I'm also the lead recording engineer. Um, we do programming all around the city and virtually uh, as well, and I engage with technology um, in, uh, in a myriad of ways on all these platforms. Um, I think my primary focus is being a recording engineer, so um, I really, really love working with audio technology, whether it's, uh, you know, old or inexpensive and also, you know, love nerding out about the new fancy stuff too. And, um, you know, just like sort of uh, Yao uh, mentioned, you know, I, I love working with artists and figuring out really what the best um, solution for uh, their vision is and um, kind of working with the tools that are available and accessible for everybody. Um, I think uh, there's a lot more, but I think that's a good start. And um, can uh, pass it on to Tamara. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Tamara Valdez. Um, I'm a Mexican American woman in her late 30s with long brown wavy hair. I'm here in my home office um, wearing a black hoodie um, and in front of uh, two screens right now for, for note taking and for uh, being in tune with you all. Um, so I'm a producer at Public Media Institute, which is headquartered in Bridgeport. Um, we are a long-standing organization that has stemmed from Lumpen Magazine um, that then kind of transformed into numerous platforms. We're, we're uh, known for Lumpen Radio at 105.5 FM. Um, we also have Community Canteen uh, that we started over the pandemic um, to serve free food to um, thousands of residents in Chicago, um, and then as well as Lumpen TV, which is now our uh, streaming and broadcasting platform um, 
that we work with um, not only artists that are exhibiting at our gallery space, Co Prosperity, um, but also as a media partner um, in order to provide live stream services to um, organizations here in Chicago. Um, yeah, and we, you know, I think we're really interested in ways that we can provide our resources to the community in Chicago um, and also to train artists in order for them to also become um, efficient in, in media and, uh, you know, radio to television to um, setting up their own exhibitions. So I think um, Public Media Institute does a really good job in um, spreading their knowledge and, and resources and training. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Clover. And we miss Nick, who is our managing director, um, lead of, of all things happenings at, at Public Media Institute. So um, we just wish him uh, some well wishes today. Thank you all so much. That was great. Um, as I've already told the presenters for the audience, um, as we go through this, this conversation to make sure that we get to as much information as possible, I um, may at a moment put this book in front of the screen to remind our presenters to, um, to keep it short so that we can uh, make sure we hear from as many people as possible. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to ask our first question today. Um, I think, first of all, this is just such a wonderful, timely discussion because during this, the last year and a half, everybody's really been um, trying to understand what their relationship is to digital media. So this first question, um, which I would like to hear from a few of you on this, but I'll start with Yao. What do you think um, the advantages are of recording versus live streaming? Um, well, recording versus live streaming, uh, I, I would say quality most of the time uh, and, and time wise as well too, because a lot of time for me, recording will give you a higher quality uh, or at least the ability to be able to do a higher quality because of uh, uh, you can move you, you can move certain things things around like cameras on lighting and sort of focus on 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 the scenes themselves and do cuts that way uh, while with live streaming it's almost uh you just have to you just have to sort of do a general either uh, you know certain cameras uh set up where 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 they can either be stationary or if you have moving cameras you can have them uh you know you can have them pre-recorded to be able to to sort of find these marks or spots uh, during the live stream, uh, but there, there, it's a little bit more. There's a lot more unknown, I think, in the live streaming as well too. Like you know, uh, you can uh, you, you can lose anything from an audio, from a camera, your internet uh, quality, and all that um, while doing that itself. So, so it's harder to control quality, at least for me, uh, live streaming. Or there, I mean, it's not. It's there. There are ways to sort of troubleshoot it while you're doing it. Uh, but there is a lot more troubleshooting that needs to happen than a pre-recorded uh, piece. Yeah, I mean, I would, I agree that I, I have uh, felt the the pressure of quality and and troubleshooting in live stream production. Um, I would also say that you know, live stream brings out um, always some uh, impromptu uh, conversation or responses that just kind of happenstance. Um, I think that there's some something really fun about live streaming where um, you kind of bring out like the humanity in everyone and you're just kind of like kind of moving with the flow, um, understanding um, if uh, someone needs to be um, relieved or picked up or, you know, you're kind of uh, running the room, uh, so to speak, and, and responding that way. Um, I think as a producer, on the back end of things, I'm always kind of trying to find out, um, trying to think of the next scene or the next step and preparing that way in live stream. And I think with, with recording, you know, you always kind of do that in post-production. Um, but lately at PMI, we've been doing a, a mix of both. With, uh, with our live stream productions and doing post after? Uh, for me, it really uh, depends on whether or not, like Yao was saying, you have very strong internet <laughs> and uh, uh, ethernet connection to it and where you're going to show this uh, 
between whether or not you record or live stream. And if you have multiple elements, a lot of people like to mix in uh, multiple elements such as a performance and talking and 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 uh, other spaces being in more than one place. So depending on the number of elements you have and whether or not you can have strong internet and whether or not you actually like uh, tomorrow is saying if you need to talk to the audience, if you don't need to talk to the audience or have a conversation, what is the actual value of it being a full on live stream versus a pre recorded live stream because there are levels of live there's the you know. So that that's my take on it. I think these are all really great points and I think one way that we think about it here when we work with artists is like intentionality uh, behind the work, I feel like streaming work streaming artworks. Uh, change the work in itself or. Um, when an artist can approach a new work with the intention of streaming, it becomes very powerful as opposed to an artist taking work that was intended for a live audience and then adding live streaming on top of it is a completely different approach. So I just kind of wanted to point that out with this sort of thinking about intentionality behind live streaming and how the artwork can um, benefit from these struggles with the technology if it's thought about ahead of time. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I really appreciate the notion of intention, intentionality and, and really thinking through, you know, what's the form that you, you want to have. Um, that said, I know there are a lot of organizations that are trying to both have a live component and, a, and a, a virtual component right now in order to extend, um, extend what they offer to those who may not be able to be vaccinated or who continue to reap the benefits of, of joining performances or events virtually. Um, from your perspectives, what makes this successful? How can you get great video for an audience that is both live in person and on a camera? I'm gonna um, I'm gonna shoot this to Michonne first. For a uh, great video for hybrid uh, at the Logan Center, I know that one way that we work with that is to do what's called live switching between multiple cameras um, that is having three to four cameras set up at various angles uh, as well as someone with a uh, handheld walking around for better close-ups and there's someone at a panel up at the top of the theater that is actually switching between each camera as the it, it, as the performance is going on and that way the and that feed is going out to the to the audience on the digital audience so what you're in effect doing for them is the work that the audience is doing for themselves as they're sitting in the stage by choosing what they see or what they pay attention to so that's one of the ways that you can work with uh presenting the piece to an audience but that takes direct knowledge of the performance by the person who's doing the live switching or someone working with that person to get what you would deem are the best elements of the performance during your switching. And sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. I liken it to um, if we've all been to Millennium Park before and we sit and we watch the big screen at Millennium Park where they're doing when they're doing live switching and they're sitting on the piano and the the trumpet player is soloing. So you, it, you, you, a person must really know the show in order to make that work effectively. Thank you. Um, Yao, I think you had some things to offer to this question as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, well, it was, we, we just finished a uh, uh, Arab dance seminar here, uh, which was a, li a hybrid of live audiences in the space of uh, participating in the class, as well as a virtual on Zoom. And we had a switcher and an audio engineer and myself here. Uh, and it was it was the experience of the people that were on the Zoom. Uh, I mean, like we got a lot of compliment uh, uh, for for like they felt like they were in the space because uh, we had a really great switcher here who who sort of who knew 
uh, a rhythm and be able to sort of uh, go with the musicians who were playing and the dancers that were in the space who were participating in the class and the switcher was basically switching really like there are parts where the music were really quick and fast and would switch to the performers and switch right back to the to the dancers and and that gave I think a lot of the the zoom participants the feeling of being in the space because it wasn't just a still camera for them to watch uh, but it was it was the um, <clears throat> sort of the improv uh, of of camera work in this in the space that that wouldn't have happened you know if, if it wasn't live in that way uh, because everything could have been pre recorded I guess for that but but I think people uh, like like for for me for for example I I, I always like to say that uh, like uh, I like to show um, mistakes or I like to show uh, uh, technical glitches if they do happen like to acknowledge them. As well too because that's part of the whole charm of being live i guess on live streaming in a way like if there's anything that 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 has that has some sort of technical uh there has been some technical problems um like for example when we do our nasty brutish short um uh noah genix who is the puppeteer host or of the show usually i would always tell him you know it's like hey you know I, the mic went out or this went out and he used the acknowledges and sort of make fun of it or use that as a as part of the process. And I think a lot of people are very engaged, you know, they engage with that. Uh, yeah. I think, um, you know, just circling back to my uh, earlier point about intentionality, I like to, when I'm approaching um, live streaming, I like to think about audience perspective. Um, and if it's a hybrid uh, event, are we trying to present this event, the stream of the event, as if you're an audience member in the seating with other people? Or is this a separate production? Is it a different experience? And I think about these things with audio and video. Do we want to try to represent the audio the same way that the people in person are hearing it? Or are we taking close line feeds and mixing them in a different way? Same with cameras. Like we don't, we have one pair of eyes. Um, and we can't get close-ups on artists' fingers playing a guitar. And that's a really cool thing to be able to see live, but it's not the perspective of the audience. So um, just again, back to intentionality, I think it's specific to the work. And this is a conversation I, I have with um, artists all the time. What do you want your audience to see in the virtual world? Because it's very clear what they're going to see in the real world, because the chairs are there and the stage is there. So where do we put the chairs and the stage in the virtual world? And that's something we like to consider. I think at Lumpen TV in particular, we are kind of, you know, playing around with this DIY aesthetic and, and um, older TV history um, and, and setting up um, ways in which the viewer in a hybrid performance can kind of see these, uh, background of, of a camera person or um, um, we just actually recently finished a production with Paul Derica who, who works at the Newberry. He's a Chicago historian and we did this like seven scene reenactment in our gallery and we um, were able to show the public and a personal audience in the gallery um, just kind of like the workings of what goes on in these kinds of productions that kind of took on this like TV set. So um, I think that's that's something really exciting for us. Um, and in our transmissions with Lump and Radio, you know, we're trying to give uh, the background, you know, these kinds of like more personal interactions with our radio hosts through a through a hybrid uh, transmission. This is all really interesting. Thank you. Um, so we've talked, I think, a little bit more about video than sound, although they're both they both kind of go hand in hand with this discussion. But um, for those who are joining us today, what do you find are the best ways to capture sound outside, inside a venue, pre-recording, live recording? And Alex, I'll hand this one to you first. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely dependent on on, on the content. Um, and uh, like I was saying earlier, you know, when I when I capture sound, even when I'm just recording 
say, a record with uh, musicians, I think about listener perspective. And, um, you know, we have this like amazing ability as humans to um, hear things in multiple dimensions because of our two ears on different sides of our heads and how we can like um, interpolate stereo sound and um, experience a very immersive sonic environment. Um, so trying to think about that in a recorded way and also a sh in streaming is really important. Um, and like I was saying, if we think about something as just like uh, uh, what an audience member might hear if they're sitting in a among a bunch of other people in a chair watching a performance on a stage, um, they would be hearing, say, a mix of acoustic instruments far away from them and maybe perhaps some amplification coming out of a PA, all coming towards them in like one sort of plane, you know, and that could be easily recreated, say, with just a really nice pair of stereo microphones. And that would be an approach I would do for something that was kind of a little more of a realistic experience of a live event. Um, but with um, things like multi-channel audio mixers and, you know, condenser microphones that are small that we can put places that are close to instruments, we can create something that's very hyper-realistic and create a whole nother almost surreal ex audio experience of a performance. So, you know, we have a jazz trio and I can put a microphone like two inches away from the cellist's bow. And um, in the virtual world, during a stream, the audience can hear this and have a perspective that's completely different than from a live performance. So again, it's really about intention and it changes the work, but um, thinking about that difference between using every piece of gear you have versus maybe just a couple microphones, I think both can be very um, successful. Um, and there's a lot of like tech stuff that we don't have time to go into now, but um, levels are very important. And I just want to say for everybody thinking about live streaming um, with audio, be very considerate about what the sound system is that your listeners are listening on. And the unfortunate reality is, is it's most likely laptop speakers. Um, and so uh, having some sort of understanding of how to manipulate audio to maximize it for that is very important. Thank you. Um, uh... So let's say you don't have access to um, some of these tools. You don't have a booth for mixing. You don't have several cameras or several microphones. What are some inexpensive ways to really boost your media? What do you? What would you say to the folks on here who are really small nonprofits um, that have a very limited budget um, and you know, still want to be able to fulfill this need. I can, I can take that as the <laughs> DIY option of the group. Uh, we've had uh, at Iodale, we've had a lot of, a lot of success with uh, later model cell phones, which have really good cameras on them, a gimbal, which is a, an electronic stabilizing device for your cell phone and microphone attachments for your cell phone, a shotgun mic with uh, wind muffs on it to record video. And I think the part that has been comes, become super useful for us is also having an, an editor to um, mix down and do these things after the fact and color correct and things of that nature when you're putting together uh, videos. But we have used our cell phones to do a lot of video, a lot of our video and, and been able to get really good quality uh, with that, with those late model cell phones uh, with 4K and even Ultra HD um, uh, video on the phones. Audio wise, because we're an African uh, drum company that is typically using between seven to 15 drums <laughs> at a time, um, We've had issues with sound uh, on our equipment and using sound and getting a good sound. Sometimes we try to record our sound first uh, separately and then dance to that track so that it's uh, 
you know, we have a good quality sound that we can put behind the video. I know with our dance classes, uh, which are over Zoom, at the very beginning of the pandem uh, pandemic, Zoom was awful with audio of any sort. Uh, and we we were using microphones plugged into the to the laptop to sort of deaden, deaden the sound a little bit to get better sound from the drums. And we had to cut back on the number of drums we were using to make sure that the sound could be heard. Zoom has gotten better with their options for sound. There's ways that you can um, set settings on Zoom to uh, for music and so that your sound is better and our classes are infinitely better with that. Our hybrid classes are infinitely better with that. So those are some of the, the DIY options that and the, the sort of lower tech options that we, we are able to use inside and outside for capturing video and audio. Um, yeah, I think uh, it, it's it's like again going back to 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 the technology you have. Like, I mean, you can use it as 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 your your, your different type of paints. Like, you can use an old cell phone. The quality of it, you know, whatever it is, you can mix that together. I think to sort of to, to and figure out how to use that as part of the story you're telling in a way. Like, we've used I've used old cameras before uh, to be able to sort of tell that. That, that story of it was sort of an emotional, sort of reminiscent, um, uh, nostalgic feeling, uh, instead of going to the filters, you know, to create those filters, because you see a lot of filters now are they start creating these sort of, you know, 1990 camera looks that you can just get really cheap from the from the thrift store, or if you have one around, you know, or even old camera cell phones uh, and things. Um, I've used a lot, yeah, the microphones on, on cell phones are a lot, are, are really, are pretty good nowadays. I use that a lot as well too. If I don't have anything like, especially if we're doing like Zoom, like when we do puppet shows um, on Zoom, uh, we have puppeteers. Sometimes you know they they're just talking to their microphones and they're very far. So I just tell them you know just pick up your cell phone, dial in, and then just have your cell phone next to you, and that way we can you know we have a better quality sound than than just using the the, the microphone from your computer that's about probably about you know ten feet or six feet away from you. Um, and uh, but yeah, I think um, there are there are way, there are a lot of creative ways to use uh, uh, these these older devices to be able to create with. And I think it's just taking time to sort of think about it and how how do you use it to tell a good story. Like I I I, mean, I love TikTok. I use, I watch TikTok sometimes to sort of watch uh, sort of how people use media and things. Uh, and and there are a lot of people who are, who are using are using it very creatively. Of course, there are a lot of people who are also cheating by using a very expensive equipment, which you can tell, you know, to create the quality. But I see a lot of great storytelling, you know, just using just a simple phone camera and microphone. Thank you both so much. Um, so what is the most uh, important thing that you have learned? about using digital media during this last year and a half. Um, I open this to whomever would like to start first on this question. Accessibility, thinking of ways that this performance or production can be accessible and get creative with that. And, you know, don't, um, yeah, don't second guess like the ability to like monitor a chat and engage your audience that way. And, um, you know, definitely always um, think about or even like consult with other other colleagues about like, hey, what do you think about this production? And does it seem like we'll be able to engage even a younger crowd, an older crowd, you know, like thinking um, a lot about that when you're producing a run of show. You know, I think for, for us, we've really been even thinking about like our Zoom, um, our live stream Zoom conversations as um, just as just uh, well produced as some kind of in-person production in the gallery, you know, that, that you can, you know, test levels with your guests and teach them how to use the media as well and help them um, train on these new platforms. Um, I think, it's been really exciting to um, kind of, you know, get uh, get some kind of guests kind of en enlivened by the use of Zoom and like knowing how to use all these other options. I mean, that's been really exciting and, and finding ways that um, you're just training and spreading that kind of knowledge. 
Uh, we've learned that it is a viable option. We've learned that it is also a great way to increase your audience. We've had uh, people taking classes from Hawaii, uh, the actual continent of Africa itself, whole other places that would not have been able to come to in-person classes. So you, we've gained audience and gained a whole nother uh, set of communities from hybrid classes. And also as the paywalls have been invented or gotten better, it is an actual option for presenting a show with people paying, uh, which was something everyone was trying to scramble to figure out at the beginning of the pandemic. Yes, I can present media, but how is that helping me pay the people who are performing? And now that paywalls have gotten better um, and there's more ways to present your media and have people actually pay for it, I think that it's an actual viable option. It does not take the place of in-person art by any means, shape or form, but it is a viable option. Yeah, I also think, um, at least what I've learned is, uh, it's, it's a really great tool to use for fundraising as well with, you know, I think going in the future a combination of, you know, of live performances and fundraising uh, with, with a live stream or, or some sort of production. Uh, because it, it also brings in revenue after the fact that it's, after it's done, you know, we leave it on. Like, I mean, we I, I worked on another organization during the early pandemic uh, to do some fundraising for uh, COVID relief for a lot of the, a lot of the uh, organizations uh, in, in sort of underserved neighborhoods. And we were able to raise over $80,000 after like the first, the first time when we, I mean, the first, the first night when we did the live stream, you know, we raised like 10,000, but after that, the week after, uh, I think, you know, like money is to kept pouring into the, you know, to the production that's, or to the, the fundraiser itself. And so, so yeah, so I think as long as it, you definitely do have to have a strategy, uh, um, uh, a fundraising strategy for that and, and, and the media reach outreach for it as well too, but, but I think it's possible and it does give accessibility as well. Um, well, you're referencing fundraisers, um, but for overall marketing, how would you recommend uh, really leveraging your media? We've used, um, as Yao said, for, for fundraisers and just using social media in itself to stay connected to your community and to keep having the conversation with your community, whether or not you're performing or not. Uh, here's, you know, just here's what we're doing. What are you doing? Here's a way you can interact with us. Here's a little dance piece. Come dance with us. You, you know, do your version, TikTokify everything. Do your version and, and give it back to me and tag us. So it's just a way to create increase your community engagement. Um, a marketing tool to create to, to increase your community engagement and like I said it's another viable option for getting paid as well. Um, but it also then digital media and video has opened opened up the door to other forms of digital and made those more uh, prevalent things like QR codes and donating via QR codes and paying for things via QR codes and using apps to do to watch things and do things. So it's it's technifying, if I can make that a word, your audience a little more. And that's that's a you're end up ending up being able to do more with your audience without actually being in front of them or with them um, with technology, based on the fact that they've gotten used to sitting in front of a screen or holding their phone and doing more things on their phone. I would also, um, Go ahead, sorry. sorry, Alex, <laughs> um, speaking of partnerships, um, I would, I was going to mention partnerships, you know, really think about, uh, digital media as another way to partner with an organization that, you know, maybe has a different mission, but aligned with like new values or even, um, may have other strengths in technology or media and then partner with them to help you create, um, a more interesting production, you know, for, for PMI, we, we partnered with ESS this past year, and we've really been able to um, troubleshoot and find really successful productions together. Um, so that was really an exciting way for us to learn and, and 
also just figure out how to use this media to its best ability and to broaden our viewership through the partnership. Yeah, well, um, I, I feel like at ESS, we've learned a lot from um, this partnership with PMI and Lumpin, as well as other collaborations. So this has been an amazing time to be able to kind of like, um, you know, move out of our box, you know, and, and, and be inspired by other folks doing this kind of stuff. But one thing I wanted to say in terms of like leveraging the media is um, um, the, the, the sort of like um, benefit of doing this over the past almost like two years at this point is this like amazing archive we've created. We're all recording things now. I mean, we are recording studio. We've been always producing things since, you know, the mid eighties when ESS was founded, but um, um, we, over the past few years, we have amassed this amazing archive of like music and art and performance within this time period that would have not been created and as accessible as it is now if it wasn't for the pandemic, forcing us to kind of redefine what we were doing. Um, so, you know, um, we, you know, we, we use various platforms for streaming, but everything we do, we end up archiving onto our YouTube channel, which is open and accessible to everybody. And just kind of going back to that and seeing the like, you know, almost a thousand different pieces of work that have been created um, that we can kind of pull from for marketing or pull from for that the artists themselves can pull from for their own portfolios. Um, it's just um, really exciting to think about this as an archival moment. Yeah, I almost feel like it's it's also created a lot of bridges as well too. Like we can like we we do uh, bridge the bridge dance festival uh, here, where we're able to have Japanese artists in Japan also be able to submit and and create things as well too, and that have to be here in the space. Uh, it's also something that um, I've sort of been trying to explore here at Links as well too. The idea of being able to connect either technicians who don't have to be in the space, you know, or or artists that don't have to be in the space as well too and still be able to collaborate and work uh, in remote areas as well too. So I think that's been one of the great uh, learning uh, thing, uh, ability or what I've learned about during the, during the pandemic. You're muted. Oh, it seems like she's having trouble. It seems I see it like muting on and off very briefly. Yes. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you yes. are. Yes. Okay, my space bar works, but nothing else does. Cheers. So, <laughs> thanks for. I'm so glad you can hear me. <laughs> um, I can no longer see the chat or the participant list. Um, I don't know what's happening on my end, but the fact that I could talk is is something. So we'll just keep going. Um, before we um close out the hour, I wanted to make sure everybody had the opportunity to, to share with our viewers what it is that you or your organization can offer to those who are here. And then we're gonna move on to the questions that people have sent in um, and also have put into the Q&A, which I was able to see before I lost my ability to um, navigate Zoom. I can, uh, who, I can help okay. assist with that too if you've Thank lost. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that is the difference between recording and live streaming. Um, cool. So I'm sorry. I so we're talk about the or, or what our organizations are offering at this point, right? Okay. I'll jump. I'll start. Um, um, Experimental Sound Studio. Um, we we started as a um, specifically an audio recording space um, that was uh, affordable and accessible for artists looking to um, experiment. Um, and an experiment, you know, is uh, uh, to our definition, not a experimental music is not a type of music, but it's a process of making work. And, um, you know, all the studios that were available when um, the organization was founded were relatively expensive and when you would go and record music there you'd feel like you know you had an engineer or you're watching your watch all the time and you felt dollars racking up and we wanted to build a place that um 
allowed artists to be able to sort of uh, stretch their wings and spread out and take their time and really develop their work and feel fine um, failing as well. And that's a very important part of it. Um, and so now we've expanded, we have a full service recording studio with a live room and a um, uh, separate recording booth with um, that oh, we can, that artists can work with one-on-one uh, -on -one with an engineer. Um, and uh, we also do mixing and mastering services for film and music. Um, but now we also offer live stream and video production uh, in studio and also um, anywhere around the city. We have a pretty robust um, mobile kit that we can do multiple cameras, uh, multi-track audio recording, and um, it can be produced in a way that also requires no post-production if um, that's part of it too. So these are the kind of things we offer and also uh, workshops and a lot of learning opportunities. So ESS.org is how you can reach us. I can chime in in that Iodele does not offer anything in this area, but I also work at the Riva and David Logan Center for the Arts, which has a community arts partnership process uh, where we offer high quality uh, performance space and uh, three, four camera live switching video setup that you can do on the south side of Chicago. At, you would just need to become a partner with the, or, with, uh, the organization, which is my area. And uh, so reach out to me at Logan Center for the Arts. Um, my email is my first name at uchicago.edu. And uh, we can talk about partnerships and performing in this space and recording video if necessary. Um, at PMI, we love to partner with other organizations and provide um, our tools and our space for um, other productions uh, in which maybe you don't have that space or those tools, we're happy to partner and provide those kinds of things. Um, we also enjoy doing trainings and workshops. Um, and we also really love it when artists kind of, you know, if they're gonna have an exhibition, we also want them to experience radio and TV. And um, I mean, a lot of our content is produced by artists. So I think um, that's, these are some things that uh, we're open to. Um, and we have incredible uh, trained engineers in radio and other media productions. So um, we're always happy to share those resources as well. Um, you can reach out to Nick at publicmediainstitute.com and he will funnel out your question to the, to the right person. Um, and you can find us at publicmediainstitute.com. Yeah, at Linksaw, uh, we also we provide um, live switching as well too, where you can connect four cameras uh, to our, our um, switcher. Uh, we have two PTC cameras, which are basically remote control cameras where you can uh, move around into the space, zoom in, zoom out, and record over, I think, I want to say 900 uh, uh, marks where you can, it can it remember where it's at. Uh, and then we also have two Blackmagic cameras. Uh, 4K cinema to, or cinema to be able to add into that mix uh, to mix the, the, the video quality. Um, and, and yeah, we do hybrid live show as well to uh, here, uh, being, being able to um, live stream and do live show. We have you know, a lighting grid here with a lighting designer, sound engineer, and, and a live switcher as well to here. Uh, and you can uh, look, look us up at linkshall.org to get more information. Oh, Clover, your the audio again. Okay. We will also send, yes, all right. Um, some weird click space bar combination is working for me. Um, so we will also send out this information uh, to everybody by email when we send out the recording of the video so that you have this contact information. So don't worry if you didn't get the chance to write it down. Um, thank you everybody so much for being here today and for answering what seemed like just a few questions within this full hour. We're now going to move into our Q&A session. I have a handful of questions that I can ask and then I'm going to turn it over to Alex, I think, to help me with anything that's come up since I've been, um, since I am now unable to use the full functionality of Zoom. 
So um, people are really interested in hearing more about live captioning. Um, so the first piece, the first question we received uh, about live captioning is just basic. Which platforms do you use and recommend? You mean live streaming? Yes, did I say something different? You said live captioning, yes. Oh, geez, yes, <laughs> I'm looking at the captions. That's, that's the problem, yeah. No worries. Um, um, oh, go ahead. I, I was just about to say, it, it really just depends on, on what you're, you're trying to do. You, once again, the DIY version, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Vimeo, and your website can also, because you can link YouTube to your website, and sometimes all of them at the same time, knowing that when you live stream all of them at the same time, you typically need someone to sit in each space to monitor questions and or have a conversation with whoever is uh, watching your live stream if you want to be um, fully engaged with the community. But for the for the most part, um, each social media section uh, app now has is creating their own live producer uh, for you to use when producing live video for for them. Yeah, in, in my experience, um, there's not not really much quality difference between platforms. Um, it's it's minimal and it's really about where your audience lives um, and how they get funneled into watching that that live streams. So like Michonne said, you know, YouTube has a really robust streaming platform and it's, you know, within the Google sphere. So a lot of people tend to already be comfortable with that interface. Um, Twitch is also a very, very common streaming platform, but it's, uh, you know, originally was sort of for the gamer community and a lot of artists and performers have um, adopted it, but it's a very like uh, foreign interface, I think for a lot of uh, newcomers to that. Um, so, um, you know, the quality of the video between YouTube and Twitch are, aren't different and the way you connect to it is, is essentially the same. Um, but it's where you think your audience would feel more comfortable going to. Um, one thing that we tried is um, Bandcamp has a really wonderful new streaming um, platform that allows you to ticket your event in a really robust way that's integrated with your um, artist page on Bandcamp. Um, so it's a great way, you know, so that's, you know, connecting to it and the quality of it is the same as all the other ones, but the interface allows you to um, receive um, ticket costs through through Bandcamp, whereas YouTube, you can make something private, but there's no ticketing interface. And there's just these little interface things that vary throughout the platform. So um, the other thing I would say is that there is something called multicasting where you can stream to multiple platforms at once um, and but you need a service to do that. Um, so one of them would be called Restream. Um, and we found at ESS that sometimes it's maybe beneficial, but it's also think about the possibilities of diluting your audience, right? You want everyone to be in the same room together watching your concert is, is kind of how we approach it. Awesome. Um, can you hear me? Excellent. All right, the next question we have is what is the average cost for an event to do the multi camera live streaming with someone who controls what view the audience sees. At Logan, uh, it's it's a, a part of the partner cost it's a low cost option as of this moment it's something we started in the COVID environment because we were not allowed to have audiences. So we were allowing partners to come in and film whatever it is they wanted to film and then walk away with a high quality video um, because they could not have uh, butts in seats. But now um, that the world has opened back up and people are having audiences, we're still offering that option of video that is still built into the cost of renting the, the room, renting the performance hall but that may change going forward. So basically for us, it's the cost of the person who is doing the switching. It's the cost of the switcher at this moment. Um, but like I said, that may change. 
Uh, yeah, at Lynx here, uh, I believe we're charging about 50 an hour for the space rental and then uh, $20 a, a, a technicians, uh, depending on, on how many technicians you need. Uh, so a lot of time uh, I have a consultation with, with the artist uh, figuring out, I was like, oh, okay, so you'll, you'll, you'll probably need an audio engineer for this, so it's 20 an hour for that, and then, uh, and then also maybe a, a live switcher as well. So, so yeah, so it varies. So it's 50 for, for the rent of the space and then 20 per technician that we're adding on. Great, thanks. The next one asks you to imagine that you are in charge of a live chamber music performance. What would you recommend for uh, high quality live streaming? Um, I, I guess I can jump in. I, we've done a, a handful of sort of similar chamber and um, also acoustic jazz ensembles. Um, it's, it's, it's a really difficult um, question to answer just because um, budget is like a really big part of that question. Um, but um, and how many cameras you want? There's some there's some big pieces to the equation that are very expensive if you want high quality. One of them is a computer. So a lot of people already have the computer, maybe, but um, uh, you know you you want a fairly new computer that can handle video processing. That's where you're streaming from. Um, but I guess if just to sort of boil it down, really like any modern camera that can output HDMI, um, at least at 1080p, um, that looks decent to your eyes, that has a good lens, right, can be a really nice quality. So first thing you need to think about is what's, you know, what's capturing the video, right? We get a couple good cameras. Then you have to look into um, if you want to be able to live switch between those cameras. So Blackmagic makes something called the ATEM Mini, which is a really wonderful, um, HDMI camera switcher that will plug into your computer and your computer will recognize it as a web camera. And um, you can then um, use a piece of software to then stream out that image of the web camera. So a very common software that a lot of us use is called OBS, which is a free software for uh, broadcasting video and audio. Um, so um, I guess a very simple answer to that question um, for the video side of it would be one or two cameras, uh, some sort of switcher that can plug in, take video input into a computer and OBS. That's all you would need. Um, on the audio side of it, with just that setup, you would be relying on the built-in um, microphones on the camera, which is aren't great usually. So if you wanna step the audio side up a notch, you would need um, something called an audio interface, which does something similar to the video switcher, but instead it takes audio and sends that to your computer and will have multiple microphone inputs. So you can set a microphone on each uh, musician, or if it's a nice acoustic space, you can have a pair of microphones capturing the space. Um, that's plugged into the interface. The interface is plugged into the computer, and then OBS marries that audio signal to the video signal, and that gets streamed out. So, um, like I said, like what the specific pieces of equipment are for each of these layers of the signal flow, there are thousands of options. Um, but um, the those are the building blocks that you need uh, essentially for a high quality stream of something like that. Uh, could I also just clarify, like, we actually, we do have different ranges for prices depending on shows as well too, and then just rehearsals and things here. Uh, but I also can show you uh, sort of how the switchers sort of work as well. If uh, I'm going to switch to the black magic that we have, uh, it's the ATEM here, so you can sort of see, we have, I mean, you can't see there, but I have a camera that's up here that's movable uh, that I can, you know, pan anywhere and have it remember where it's at. And you can sort of switch different, you know, camera views as well too, which you have another camera over there. Uh, but yeah, that's, yeah, just to, talking about the ATEM black magic uh, switcher. That was super cool. Thanks for the uh, show and tell. As you know, I we did a run through and I didn't know what a gimbal was and and Michonne ran off and got her whole setup to show me. Do you happen to have that right now? Just yeah, this is the entire setup. I love this so much. So practical, so wonderful. Um, 
And I know that there's also a question for Michonne in the in the Q and A, which I think has to do with microphones, but I I can't access it. So the phone goes here. Uh, the new D, uh, DJI four is uh, magnetic, so there's a man magnetic holder for the phone. The phone goes here. This is the microphone with the windscreen on it. So um, and I just have it in a holder, and then this is because. You know, they make you buy dongles. Now they take all of the ports off the phone and make you buy dongles. So this Michonne, is, the question is asking it to sorry, you know, what what specific model as well for that shotgun microphone that you've that you're using? Oh, this is a road shotgun, I think. I also have a micro one, I think it's called, but I believe this is the road shotgun. Uh, literally, all of this is at Best Buy. Uh, so this is a Rode, and this it comes with the Rode microphone comes with the fuzzy cat, the windscreen, and then um, it also comes with this cord, and then this is the dongle I had to buy this piece right here because there's no longer in, uh, a headphone jack on your phone, and so that's what this is for, and this plugs into the end of your phone, which I happen to have an Android and not a Mac. I mean, not an Apple phone. So not an iPhone. So that that pretty much is it. And then I put um, a stand on it so that I can sit it down sometimes. And the stand, this actually comes with um, the DJI uh, gimbal. There are several different gimbals out there. So it's in it, literally all of this is two hundred dollars or less. That's awesome. I love the range that you all represent in terms of what you've worked with, what you have and what you're working with every day. Um, all right. What do we have any other questions in the Q&A or in the chat? Someone asked, um, can you recommend a good platform for streaming a combination of pre-recorded videos with real time panel discussions? Um, and I, I wanted to reiterate that I think this is kind of a common misunderstanding that it's not the platform that determines whether or not you can do this kind of thing. It's what you're producing locally. The platform itself is, you can stream anything to the platform, whether it's YouTube or Twitch or um, um, Bandcamp or whatever the ones we talked about. But um, I think the question that you're asking is how do you kind of first produce the combination of real time and playback and then stream it to the platform? Um, so what I would say is that OBS is a great start for this. Um, the software OBS for Mac or Windows can um, play back video and audio as well as uh, present live video and live audio. And what you're doing is you're managing that production locally on your computer and then sending it out to the platform. So if that makes sense, it's not platform specific to be able to accomplish that. It's what's happening locally first before you stream it. Yeah, there's something also on OBS that you can do as a virtual cam as well too, uh, which I've used. Uh, I mean, there's a learning curve also with that, especially if you're doing it through using it as a, a camera feed to Zoom, there is a delay uh, for it. But yeah, but it's it's a very useful tool. Uh, OBS open, is an open source, so there's also multiple a uh, user created a uh, um, you know add uh, add on that you can add on to your your OBS to be able to to do a lot of creative things with it. You can do green screen. You can do all kinds of things with it. There's a question in the Q and A about paywalls and ticketing and what people are finding useful. It really for us it really is what you think your audience will 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 resonate with there are apps that will do the whole process for you from the ticket to the presenting of your of your piece of work and unique codes for each person and everything of that nature they're a bit more expensive and that way you don't have what we call the netflix effect where you give out the link to something and they that person shares it with 20 of their best friends and you only get one price um that there are apps that cover all of that as well uh i can't remember some of them right now but there are there are several out there if you just google ticketing paywall or ticketing apps then there's just the lo-fi version or the low-tech version of eventbrite 
once a person registers in Eventbrite, they get an email that has the link to whatever it is, uh, the, the YouTube link or the Vimeo link, uh, whatever it is. And you can mask that by using something called Bitly to make a short link that, so then they don't know exactly where it is. Um, and that is one way that you can uh, do ticketing for your event as well. Some people just use the straight out P PayPal, Zelle, and or Cash App, whatever, like we use for dance classes. And then once you get that information, you send down the link. Some of those are a little bit more um, personnel intensive than others, like Eventbrite is automatic. You can create the email that goes out after the person registers and you don't have to monitor that. And they also send update emails like the event is starting today or the event is starting in an hour and things of that nature, you can control how many emails go out. And so it's a little less personnel intensive. Um, it just really depends what you think you will resonate with your audience. But I advise people usually to try the least expensive way first before you go into a whole app that, you know, is going to charge you X amount of dollars and add all these fees on to present your event. And then you have all these tech diff tech di technical difficulties with the app where you have to spend all this time c customer troubleshooting with it or whatever. Um, there's another question here that I, I find interesting and I, I can't really answer it with, with much depth, but I'm curious if you all have other um, input too. Um, what do we know about licenses and permissions for live streaming and recordings? Where do we go to find this information? Um, I think um, from our experience at ESS, um, you know, it's, well, first of all, there's the sort of issue of licensing and permission from using other folks' art, work, and music, and copyrighted material that then you're presenting for free. And you know, there's like YouTube has automatic things that will um, detect uh, that material and either mute it or make it ineligible for monetization and all that stuff. Um, but at ESS, we've we write up our own live stream contract um, that that really just states how we plan to uh, use the material we're streaming for the artists, what our intentions are afterwards with the recording, and what sort of rights they have to their own work, um, and just trying to kind of get that all out of the way ahead of time. So there's, um, I don't think there's, I don't know if there's anything specific to be considerate of when streaming um, new work on a platform, right? I mean, a lot of people will say, you know, if we use Twitch, which is owned by Amazon, there's a huge like, you know, um, uh, page with all the fine print of like what their rights would be when you present your work on their platform. But coming from ESS as the organization, we basically release all the rights to the artist and we essentially ask their permission to be able to present it. That's that's a similar approach that we use as well. We have a contract with with our artists um, and how the the material will be used afterward and providing them with files. Um, I do know, and on the other side of things, um, with like permissions and rights with uh, with video content, you know, that's always something uh, to get approved by from the artist. Um, we ran into some issues with um, showing video work on Twitch, which then got flagged. And so the algorithms sometimes will, will interfere. And um, however, we had the artist permission, but um, it's just the algorithm of, of some of these platforms that, that may block and uh, mute out that content. So always do a tech rehearsal with your work. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I've had, I've had where the artists themselves are the performing piece, you know, and they still get flagged saying it's copyrighted, even though it's the artist's you know, work uh, itself. Uh, but yeah, it, I, I always, I also suggest sort of doing, uh, if, if I know, if I, I usually ask the artist to give me the audio or whatever they have so that I can just do a sort of just a private live stream for myself uh, to be able to see if, if there's any red flag that will pop up. Uh, and it usually tells you right away as well too. At Logan, we were having this conversation with sync licenses, which is uh, for dance purposes, which is the video, the music being played to video. Um, 
you using someone else's music on your video to dance to. And it's the wild, wild west. Um, I know ASCAP is, um, has created a searchable online database of who owns what licenses to what music that people can search to find who to, to, to contact to get a sync license for their music. But how much it'll cost you is literally, it's a whole new world out there. And some people are gouging, some people are not, and it's just the wild, wild west. And it may or may not happen in a timely fashion for you either. So some people are just foregoing it. Um, we were at one point talking to lawyers for the creative arts to figure out um, some sort of workshops or something to, around how to make this happen for um, dance companies and or people. Uh, with Iodale, we haven't really had that that much of a problem as we're playing live, live drum music and that tends to not be copywritten as much or licensed as much as regular music out in the public domain. I say as much because there is licensed um, African dance music. But so, and we, you know, play our own arrangements from time to time of a traditional piece. So we don't have as much uh, worry with that, but we have discussed that uh, sync licensing and how difficult it can be to get. Great. And I think, I think maybe the, the only um, other question we didn't reach, but I think we sort of talked about it was um, from Hedwig dances just about, uh, you know, they're explaining how they're hearing that uh, producing a live virtual hybrid event would uh, require a stage and a booth and mixing a feed and three to four or five cameras, not to mention personnel who can operate the equipment. And I understand, I guess I want to say all this does seem overwhelming. Um, for a very small um, nonprofit that might only have like a handful of um, employees. Um, but I want to reiterate, you know, and like Michonne set up, like you can do a very um, nice live stream with just a new cell phone and that's it. Um, and you can even do a multi-camera switched live stream with a handful of old cell phones and OBS, which is a free piece of software. There's ways to get a bunch of old camera uh, feeds from cell phones into OBS as multiple inputs, and then have and then place them around a space, um, and then a single microphone that can cost uh, you know less than a hundred dollars. Um, this will get you very far, and it'll be virtually free or um, very inexpensive. Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I have a question for all of you, which is uh, who do you, I mean, not that you need to, but who do you consult or what resources do you consult if you have a technical question? In the past, it's been Google, but now I have all of these people. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, same. I think, yeah, Google is, uh, uh, forums are actually are really, really helpful, specifically for like certain models of things you're using. I mean, um, forums, you know, I think uh, Reddit is like a really wonderful space. Um, uh, in certain corners of Reddit is a wonderful space for discussing these things. And there's very helpful people on forums and the internet to actually have a conversation, but of course, Googling things. Um, and then I just wanted to, you know, want to say one service that that ESS offers is just consultation. So organizations that are looking to set something up, um, we will work with you within your budget to find the best tools um, that you can work with and, and, and get you up and running with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of technicians, uh, other technicians who've also been doing live streaming that I you know, would call up or talk to and say, hey, you know, have you discovered how to do this, you know, successfully uh, and other things. And also at Lynx, uh, we've also started this thing uh, called Lynx Lab, where we're, 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 we're hiring technicians, artists to all work together and sort of figure, you know, in the time span to just play and, and fail together and figure out how, you know, uh, what, you know, how to create uh, digitally uh, or for hybrid as well, too. So, yeah. If 
feel like play and fail is just like the perfect <laughs> life lesson. And for all of this, I, you know, that's an important part of making art. It's an important part of figuring out how to move forward, I'm sure, with technology. So thanks for saying that. Any other resources or any other questions that are in the chat that we can reference? We got to all the questions. Uh, I know one thing that I've been exploring and I've been wanting to explore more is this uh, program that is called Sparks AR. I'm not sure if any of you ever played with it, but they're basically you create you create filters for your lenses, um, and it's a free uh, free software uh, by Facebook that you can use. Uh, and so yeah, so it, it's I've been suggesting it to artists and other people to sort of explore that and look at that uh, to create their own filters and things because I think it'll be a great way to integrate that into either live streaming or even when you have live audience again, you know, people can download these these filters for their cameras and then you can create these photo booth on your, you know, from your phone. So That's Spark good. AR. Spark AR is a free, it's a free free program. That's awesome. Yeah, I love these new new tools. Um, one one thing we've been exploring with um one of our recent um artists in residence uh is Mozilla Hubs which is a sort of an accessible um, v virtual reality environment uh, that uh, users can customize. So it's a way to host a live stream show where people can be together virtually in a space as little avatars. And you can like walk up to each other and talk and interact, but there's also a screen where you can like watch a concert together. Um, so we've been designing spaces using um, that interface to sort of trying to transcend this um, aloneness that we all feel sometimes watching these concerts together and all we have is maybe a chat room. So it's this cool another step where we can um, be together virtually. So that's a yeah. cool, cool thing. It reminds me, Lucky Lucky Plush uh, did something with us, uh, Linksaw, where it, it was a Gather Town, which is the program, where it was like an 8-bit avatar sort of thing, and that was kind of fun to do. Uh, yeah, I was I was in Linksaw in the tech booth uh, as my 8-bit avatar with my video feed on. There's conference software like that, too, where you go to a conference and you sit down at a table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's you know, different like, then, room, like rooms yeah. or hang out by the water cooler and talk to your buddy. Yeah, <laughs> so so new. I love it. Um, Michonne, Tamara, do you have any new tools you're looking at? I mean, <laughs> at this moment. No, I mean, I I feel like I my best tools are my engineers. It's like I really lean on them for all of their knowledge. And I, um, you know, I, I feel like lately with our bridging of radio and, and TV and our streaming platform, we're learning a lot more about sound, about setup. Um, so, I mean, it's just a lot of troubleshooting, you know, I think so much about planning ahead, run of shows, rehearsals, those all really matter and they make a big difference in their in your productions. Yes, responding to Stephanie. Yes, Logan Center was involved in Gather Town too. It was a lot of fun uh, working with uh, Julie to make that happen. Uh, for us, for Iodele, we don't, we don't have our own space. We're in residence somewhere else. So the amount of things that we can do we can't really set up a whole lot of, of, of permanent type or even semi-permanent type things in the space. Everything that we do has to be able to be put away and taken down. So we would probably love to three and four camera rehearsal from time to time, but that's not something that we could actually do in our space. So we are exploring partnerships with others like a Lynx Hall um, to film uh, work indoors especially now that it's gotten cold in chicago because we did a lot of our filming outside uh during the summer we would jump up and run outside and film a video on the lake or in the park or whatever in a minute and just have cell phones and dslrs all around and just edit it and put it out there but now that it's winter and it's a little chilly in chicago we're looking to come into more spaces that have that set up for us already uh, to be able to do things of that nature and then just walk away with the video 
You know, one thing that we did recently invest in was a new router so that we could do offsite remote live stream. Um, and we recently did that in um, at the South Ashland Bridge House with the Tender House project. And we were able to live stream radio, um, our radio feed and our uh, streaming platform all together from that one router. And so that router had also an ethernet cable um, and so we actually brought that to another site and we're able to connect with like a hundred foot ethernet cable. Um, but also, so it, so it serves both. It serves for the ethernet, which is secured internet for the best stream that you can get. Um, or you can use this router on offsite locations and do some live streaming there where you can connect your phone or your computer. So that investment was really good. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here today and for sharing all of your wisdom. And on behalf of the foundation, thanks to the four of you and to everybody who is on today for all of the hard work that you do, um, keeping the arts alive in Chicago. It means a lot to us.